everybody, and welcome to the Dissecting Fiction Podcast. I'm Vinny Murphy. And I'm Christian Cutlick. And today on the podcast, we're going to cover uh, the Ten of Swords, or just Ten of Swords, or X of Swords, however you feel like saying it today. Uh, the latest event amongst the mutant books at Marvel, uh, about one year in from the House of X, Powers of X relaunch. Yeah, um, almost exactly on the dot, too, but I think that's only because of COVID. <laughs> yeah, I, that's something we're going to talk about, too, probably, is the organization of this. Um, they list the two prelude issues being Excalibur and X-Men 12, um, both launching at the same time. So, yeah, roughly a year uh, from the end of House of X and Powers of X, we should we should really say, going into what I, what they called the Dawn of X, if I remember correctly. 22 issues uh, to this crossover, not unheard of as far as uh, amount of issues. In fact, I would think things like Death of Superman, Nightfall, or at least that, if not more. I, I'm actually positive that they're more. So not something completely untenable at its base, but we're going to get into <laughs> what we think uh, about the progression of this story. But to do that, once again, Christian's going to give a a brief plot (laughs) summary of what happened because I'm terrible at it. And plus, uh, honestly, this one, I probably just get really frustrated and, and, you know, forget 10 times the things that I normally would. So uh, Christian, if you want to do that, uh, go right ahead. (laughs) Right. Uh, And obviously there'd be spoilers for the whole story. Uh, It's, if you don't want to hear that, skip ahead like five minutes and, yeah, so I'll just skate straight into it. So, really, House House of X is where Ten of Swords picks up. You know, there's the mutant nation of Krakoa, and in between House of X and Ten of Swords, Apocalypse has been doing hijinks in the book Excalibur. And among those hijinks is building a portal to a place called Otherworld. And Otherworld is has been in the X-Men books since, like, Excalibur in the 80s, but it's always been like an obscure thing. And Otherworld is like a crossroads of dimensions, of every single dimension that's ever existed, ever. And in the center of these nexus of dimensions is what is called the Starlight Tower, which is run by the Omni Matrix, Magistrix, Opal, something, Saturnite. I think I got that right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, close enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she rules that starlight tower and the starlight tower is supposed to be defended by the captain britain's core captain britain being also another kind of obscure x-men excalibur character and originally there was countless captain britons and these captain britons were all destroyed way back when during the secret wars event hickman wrote like five years ago so if you're confused as to why there's no more Captain Britons except for the one, that's why Hippen does a pretty bad job at explaining that until like halfway through the run. So Apocalypse makes a portal into Otherworld, and that pisses off Opal. In fact, he makes two portals, one in Avalon and one in Otherworld. Again, this is also where it gets pretty convoluted again, because this is kind of like classic Hickman stuff, and... uh they do a bad job of explaining it, but since Otherworld is like a nexus, think of it like a wheel. And the wheel goes into all other dimensions, but that wheel is also cut up into like different kingdoms. Avalon is one of the kingdoms. So Apocalypse has a portal in Avalon and in Otherworld. And then he goes back and tells uh, the council, the Krakoan council, hey, I built a bunch of portals to this other dimension. And they go, fucking Why? And he goes, well, you know, because thousands and hundreds of thousands of years ago, Krakoa used to be one thing. Uh, It was actually split into two by these demons from another dimension called Emin. And the demons actually broke Krakoa into two. Uh, It used to be called Akora. Now it's called Krakoa and Akora. And Akora was taken into the other dimension called Emin. And during the war, we were able to beat them back, but... My wife and my kids left me to go into this other dimension to fight the demons and maybe bring back Akora and maybe refound the nation. So I built the porters to go do that. And they're like, well, the Krakoa council is like, well, I wish you like told us this. 
And it's like, no, it's fine. I told Krakoa and Krakoa is fine with it. And then they go into Otherworld thanks to the portals Apocalypse built. And they find out, oh no, uh, Amenth is actually doing kind of the exact same thing. But there are a horde of demons rampaging across the multidimensional Otherworld sphere. And they conquered one of the territories. And they're about to invade the Starlight Terror Tower so they can get to Earth and then invade Earth and reforge Krakoa with their Akura. Uh, during this siege, Saturnine basically stops the war and says, hey, instead of a war, let's do a contest. And this contest, there will be 10 contestants on each side, and each of them will have a sword. And everyone goes, okay, I guess it's better than having a war. And they go get the swords, and then they go do the contest. Uh, of course, there's more to that, but I'm sure we get into, into that. They do the contest. And eventually, Krakoa wins narrowly and kind of convolutedly, uh, which I'm sure we'll also get into. Yeah, that's definitely something that uh, has to be talked about. <laughs> <laughs> so Krakoa wins the contest. And uh, during this time, you also find out that the armies of Amenth are being led by a creature called Annihilation. The closest comparison I could think of is World of Warcraft with the Lich King. Apocalypse Wife is basically the Lich King of these demons, and she wears the helm that controls all of them. So Apocalypse fights his wife in the final battle. Uh, he defeats her, but the Helm of Annihilation, which is the bad guy controlling all the demons, decides, no, uh, I do not lose. And instead, I will just say no and just do what I was going to do in the first place and just invade everything. So it tries to invade everything. Uh, the X-Men all come together to stop it. And Apocalypse stops it by basically taking the Helm of Annihilation, wearing it, and then surrendering to Saturnine while wearing it. And because of this, this subverts like the magic powers of Annihilation, because Annihilation always wins. And he's able to force the whole army of Amenth into a surrender to the X-Men and into Saturnine. So Saturnine goes, great, perfect, this is awesome, I uh, love it. So who are you, in order to destroy this piece, we'll do an exchange of prisoners. So Apocalypse says, well, I'll go to Akora with my wife and we'll rare and have tons and tons of stuff. And then Apocalypse says, but we'll take Akora as our prisoner. So they reforge Krakow and Akora into one nation. And Apocalypse goes with his wife into Amenth and the other dimension where his wife has been living for the past 5,000 years. There's also a Larger subplot going on with Saturnine trying to rebuild the Captain Britain's core. Her main concern has been that in the Excalibur books, Betsy Braddock, who has been Psylocke for almost all this time since like she was invented, really? Betsy Braddock has become the new Captain Britain after uh, she was separated from Psylocke. Again, uh, Psylocke and Betsy used to be the same character, but now they're no longer the same character. They're two different characters. Which in yeah. itself is a whole convoluted history, too, which it, luckily we don't have to get into this time. No, but it's worth mentioning here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, Saturnine's whole subplot is that she's trying to rebuild the Captain Britain's core, but she's pissed off because of events that happened in Excalibur that Betsy is now the new Captain Britain. She instead wants Betsy's brother to be the Captain Britain because she wants to fuck him, basically. That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> and he had been for yeah uh, he has been uh, but now he's married of, and i guess that uh, matters to him now so uh do uh, also convoluted magic stuff basically what happens is that betsy is now the captain britain's in every dimension because saturnine kind of fucked up a love spell i think uh it's a bit vague but now betsy is the captain britain's of every dimension and now there's a new captain britain's core but it's not the person that Saturnine wanted. So she's kind of upset about that. But she does get everything else she wants. She's able to extend her reach into a couple of other dimensions and things like that. So that's the very quick rundown of Ten of Swords. Yeah, and here's the thing. As quick of a rundown as it is, I do think you did a, a very good job of kind of encapsulating two things here that I think are really uh, a big deal. One, the two driving stories behind this really were plots almost exclusively from the X-Men and Excalibur books uh, to start. 
Apocalypse's meddlings were really implied heavily in X- outside of Excalibur and X-Men and then were played out in Excalibur. The element that is really supposed to bring the other characters into this is the tournament aspect of the conflict uh, with the Ten Warriors. And I think there are just <laughs> a lot of problems with how this ended up playing out because of that. I'll say something right up front, because it's something that we've said in earlier podcasts. I think Excalibur, since the launch of uh, this Dawn of X, this post House of X Powers of Ten run, has been the weakest book of the group uh, of what has been really released and had time to have traction. So I think that that in itself is a bit of a flaw. And I think this almost felt like a forced crossover with a really convoluted tournament in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, when I was reading this, I was thinking like it might behoove these writers to watch some anime tournament arcs and <laughs> because um, while it's, I be Vinny and I read this very differently. I kind of shotgunned it all at once because it always felt like an event that was supposed to be read all at once. And I think you read it as it was coming out. Yeah, I was reading them as they were coming out. Also picking up issues of Excalibur, which I, I had dropped previously. Um, I was able to a certain extent to kind of get what was going on, uh, partially because I've read older Excalibur. And I do appreciate I think if there's one thing I do appreciate about this crossover is a lot of the sort of weird Excalibur stuff from the 80s and even 90s had been really left out of House of X Powers of 10. Um, This brought it back in. I I just think that it ultimately just kind of fell flat. The really the biggest thing that we get out of this is now Apocalypse is uh, off the board. One of the other subplots that kind of came bigger into the play towards the end is that a lot of people left the government of Krakoa apocalypse being the big one uh, because he went to the other dimension with his wife. Uh, They'll probably be back sometime soon. He does say that as well, but I don't know how soon is soon for Hickman because that could be like next year or like 10 years from now. That's the thing too, that I think is interesting here. You know, I, I mentioned it specifically and intentionally at the top of the show that this this is about a year into this House of X, Powers of X, Dawn of X run. I think this was a little too soon. I, I think they should have had the Apocalypse subplot brewing for a couple of years. And I realize that that's not the industry right now. And I think that's part of the problem with the industry right now. It just didn't seem like it was stewing long enough with Apocalypse, in my opinion. Well, I I was reading interviews as this stuff was coming out to kind of get a sense of what authors were thinking behind the scenes. One of the threads I picked up with is that they thought this was going to be a shorter run. I do want to like point out at the top that this run is basically piloted by both Hickman and Teeny Howard. And Hickman is the guy, you know, writing the X-Men books. And Teeny Howard is the person writing the Excalibur books. So that crossover makes sense in that context, since they're the ones that really piloted this entire event. But the other thread I was getting, yeah, that it, this was going to be a much shorter thing, but because of COVID and all these shakeups going on at Marvel, that they wanted to extend it. And it, this, this event is very long, but I do pre- appreciate how, like, I guess, concise uh, a lot of it is. I mean, it's incredibly convoluted, but if you read all all at once, I, I kind of see, like, there's character moments here or there, but I do agree that, like, I, I think a lot of what they wanted to do with Apocalypse should have been brought up more to the forefront of this. There's a whole thread with, like, Apocalypse needing to learn something, but I'm he does, but I'm not really sure what it is. Because uh, at the forefront of it is a lot of characters criticizing him for being, like, a really arrogant person. Like, he just opens portals to other dimensions and doesn't tell him. Anybody. And he kind of makes everyone agree to this really upset. Everyone is stuck with that. But the lesson he learns at the end, I think, is about surrendering, which is kind of odd to me because that wasn't really the third thing brought up in the first place. 
you know, what you're saying that this is supposed to be more concise makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I wouldn't doubt at all that this tournament angle wasn't in there, if that's the case. It's definitely more of an X-Men and Excalibur crossover than anything else. Everything else kind of feels weird. I, I'm just going to run through kind of briefly the books that were involved. Let me let me start. So, you know, you, you have your, your introductions in Excalibur and X-Men, as we were saying. They do these sort of anchor books... Uh, first, eleventh, and twenty second um, <laughs> that are X of Swords, uh, Creation, Stasis, and Destruction. Um, in between there, you get only one issue of X Factor, a uh, pretty new book. That's issue number four, which I also think is a little bit of a mistake on a lot of these. The pretty low numbers on Wolverine, Cable, Hellions—they're just getting their footing. This felt like an interruption. What I will say is I think that Ben Percy probably dealt the best with all of this. His parts with Wolverine first pursuing the sword and even a little later while they're into the tournament tend to work best. Quite frankly, it gets so convoluted that I I have a hard time even sorting out in my head what issues were what outside of the Percy stuff. And the tournament ends up feeling very sort of pointless. Uh, Not only because ultimately the tournament doesn't decide anything, (laughs) but because they keep changing the rules on all the fights and some of them aren't even like fights. And you have these issues that are supposed to be the fights where it's like almost 20 pages of characters talking. I can kind of see what they're going on here because like, when they go to the other world, it's supposed to be like the Fey Wilds and Dungeons and Dragons, where there's like not really rules, but there's also like very strict rules at the same time. I mean, for most of X Men, Other World has kind of been this like weird upside down, like hijinks world where like the X Men run around in Camelot and like meet with like Merlin and stuff like that. And Hickman really reconstructs that into this like area where like realities like converge and die and stuff like that you know usual hickman stuff i can see where the idea of is like oh you know we can do all these fun little contests and things like that come in but the way they build it up they make it seem like it's going to be a lot of like fights like it, it, they make it seem like it's going to be an anime tournament arc where like you know one character is going to fight another character and you'll like have that fight be an issue where, you know, they'll both use, like, really cool powers and things like that and try to, like, figure out each other's weaknesses. That's not really the case out of sight of, like, maybe one or two fights. And even the final fight's not like that at all. I also think that's just a general problem with American comics. American comics, I think, tend to, like, splash pages over uh, complicated fights that are usually in manga. And manga usually favors that because that's, like, filler for them. The tournament doesn't really decide anything, and it's really weird, uh, because the way they build it up is that it's going to be really important, everyone's going to use these swords, and then most of the times they're not really using the swords, and a lot of the contests are happening behind the scenes. So when it's going on, you think it's going to be like this big Game of Thrones thing, where everyone's going to be like backstabbing each other or trying to like undermine the rules. But that's not really what happens either. Uh, One of the big books, Hellions, was all about that and then it kind of doesn't really lead anywhere uh in that book you do find out that like characters motivations were different than what you thought they were but it doesn't really factor into the larger like tournament going on yeah i think that's that's a big problem too is you know some of the the bigger crossovers in the past that you know i I name dropped a little bit there was always like the sort of central focus and it, it was really you know you take a nightfall you know nightfall is about batman getting his back broken and then asriel taking over and your tie-ins are largely characters reactions that are important because they've all been dealing with batman in this case it really did just feel like these characters were being thrown into this tournament <laughs> and it, lots of them weren't competing in the tournament and were just sort of there and i, I think it did a real big disservice um, it, it's funny you brought up Hellion specifically. I think that's a book that it did a disservice to because that was had so much momentum from its start and it, now it kind of slowed down a little bit. But I, I mean, I hope it goes back. I mean, there's a lot for them to work with in Hellions now, especially, uh, you know, with half the cast just being gone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's 
shit might happening there. But like, I think it wouldn't have been such a problem. They didn't spend like the the way this has been generally constructed is that the first eleven issues of this are about finding the swords, and then the other eleven issues are about the fighting. And you spend so much time finding these swords, and they put so much weight on like, yeah, Wolverine made this deal to get more Masa. Or, like, he went to literally hell and he stabbed a demon to get this sword. And Storm had to go to Wakanda and, like, become an outlaw in Wakanda to get her sword. Or, like, Cable had to, like, power up a state station with his sword. Like, they put so much weight on these, like, objects. And then they don't use too many of them. I can't really remember anything with Muramasa coming into play. I, Wolverine does use it. Uh, in a fight, but not against the person you'd expect him to fight it with, which is odd. And I think yeah, that's why it really comes together weird. And the coolest part of that was him getting the sword after he has it and the tournament's set up like it doesn't really go anywhere. It's all <laughs> it's all sort of, you know, at the end of those 11 issues when they're they're getting into the tournament, I thought that this is when it's going to like blow up and. It's pretty similar throughout the entire story. It's so much focus on, you know, what is the real focus, which is Apocalypse and all of the subplots from Excalibur. It's just, I don't know. I think it's a waste. I think it's a waste. And I think it's taking the focus off of the cool stuff that a bunch of writers have been doing in the books without this interruption. Yeah, the focus on Excalibur, I think, is a problem, too. I, I also think it's just like, I did not know Saturnine was supposed to be in love with Betsy's brother until like issue like 16 of this fucking event. And it's like, when were you going to tell me this was like an important subplot or even like how Otherworld is set up? Like in Excalibur, it is so fucking confusing how Otherworld is set up. It's not until like, I think, Ten of Swords creation that they just show you a fucking map. And that's all I needed. And, like, they couldn't do that in all 12 issues of Excalibur. It's just really, like, bizarre to me how they, like, explain these events in this book. And, like, they often mention that the Captain Britain's core is destroyed. I did not know how it was destroyed until, like, maybe, like, issue 12 or something of Ten of Swords. It's just, like, and when they said it, it's like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But that event was, like, five years ago. Why would you expect me to remember that? You know, I know you wrote it, Hickman, but, like, it was still five years ago and Marvel tends to like just forget events ever happened. You know, like the events just usually don't matter all that much in Marvel. It It is just weird to me. And I, I think a big problem too, is just like how a lot of this is centered around Betsy and Betsy hasn't really been much of a character throughout any of these books. Uh, her main thing is that she dies in this and you find out at the end that Saturn, I was trying to make a love spell sure okay like you find that out in the very last issue is very weird like there's a lot of themes about like love and death but i don't think it really congeals together i i didn't mention like apocalypse trying to be like all sneaky sneaky about this but like he doesn't really do anything very underhanded or he doesn't do anything that's really like arrogant like outside of opening the portals he's not like throwing mutants into the battle he just asks everyone to come and I think it's just a very strange direction to go with him. I do understand it. I think it makes him a much more uh, richer character than he was before, having like this wife and children and like this lost nation of Akira. I think that's all good motivations for him to explain like why he's so obsessed with power and strength. But I think it's also like if that was like a running theme of this book, they should have put more emphasis on like scenes between him and his wife, like talking to each other or his children and things like that. Like there's a strange romance subplot between Storm and like the Horseman of Death, and it doesn't really go anywhere. I think he's stuck in the vampire dimension at the end of this, so I'm not sure what the point of it was. The problem with the event is for most of the books and most of the characters, it's neither payoff or setup, which is you know like. The first indication that maybe it shouldn't be 22 issues. It's just such a weird spot to like leave things in, considering, especially considering, you know, your last event is House of X Powers 
of 10 where you seem like you set up this entire sort of world to play in and you're already starting to like pick away at it. Uh, Not in like little ways, which is what works, but I don't know. It's just, it's made everything that was intriguing about those series and this like idea of like this unified mutant nation and how that would affect things. And that this could be how you play the X-Men for years it's already getting brushed to the side. That I think that's what bothers me the most. I I think the first year of X Men uh, of this House of X event has been like trying to define the borders of where does the mutant nation end? Because a lot of those early like yearbooks are all about like them exploring other nations or dimension or like space. Like New Mutants had them going to Shi'ar space, and I think that's where this book succeeds them because it kind of makes a definitive border of like where does Krakoa ends and it kind of ends in other world and it can't really go much farther than that. Uh, they did release also today, like a special announcement that the next like era of X-Men or whatever they're calling all of this, it's going to be the reign of X. So I think that's where we're going to get more of the like political and being able to like explore actually Krakoa because we've seen a bunch of maps of it and we've seen like settings on it but I don't think we actually like felt like we lived there or anything quite yet I I would agree with that and there still are a lot of things to explore the the burgeoning mutant religion things like that I I just I think this was ill-timed ill-planned and even the payoffs where you know you have to give some credit to Howard and Hickman for legitimately building to this moment, I just, it didn't feel like it had any impact. And I was pretty bored through most of it uh, outside of some of the Wolverine stuff, really. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even like the Hellion stuff? Hellions was good. But once again, I feel like Hellions, I would have rather have read. I would have rather had them get to like 10, 12 issues before anything got in their way. Um, I think Wells is doing a great job on it. I, I honestly still like most of the line, you know, I, <laughs> of course, I, part of this problem is probably the fact that I don't really like Excalibur right now. And a lot of the plot is coming out of that. But for the most part, I enjoyed these books and it, it did. It just felt like an interruption I, I of a lot of concepts that I want to see played out. And I think to me is a really good example of kind of what's wrong with the industry right now is not giving concepts a chance to breathe. Like, like I've really been enjoying cable and then this feels like it got dropped in the middle of it. And it's only five issues in like, you know, when they go into the storyline, it's part of the reason we're not getting these groundbreaking runs is because no one's given any time. It's weird with Marvel too, because like sometimes they give like some runs a lot of space, like the first, like Jason Aaron Thor that like tons of space to like really build that whole gore, the butcher arc before going to like the Jane Thor stuff, even like the current Venom wrong that had like tons of space to really explore what it wanted to explore. And I think, I, I think a lot of this has, it comes down with how they write the X-Men books. Um, again, like I said, I listened to interviews, like trying to see how the gears behind all of this work. And a lot of this is that this kind of like a writer's room mentality. Uh, and Hickman is kind of the head of the writer's room. And he brings all these other authors in and artists in to kind of help him build what he's kind of envisioning. So like Howard, it seems like is the one that's kind of like filling in a lot of blanks or filling in like a lot of weird ideas that Hickman hasn't really thought of. Like from what I understood, she's the one that come up with Saturnine and the whole Captain British stuff. But Hickman has been the one that came out with the whole like Amenth, all the apocalypse stuff, things like that. So I think that's why, like, I I think if you read all of this through, it feels really cohesive for something that spans, like, 22 issues. But that's also a problem with you having so many people, like, giving their input that I think, like, the themes and ideas I wanted to explore get really lost. And it's able to really build out this very fleshed out world, but I don't think it really has, like, as strong as themes as it's, it's trying to do. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think there's a lot of evidence in, uh, and you know, if you've been avoiding the spoilers, I'm probably going to get back into a little bit of that right now. Um, 
X Men fifteen, uh, which would be the last regular issue of X Men within the crossover, definitely is really well written and tries to have a lot of gravity. I just think you're so exhausted by the time you get to it that some things that probably would have more impact don't anymore um, by the time you make it through the story. <laughs> I, I think the biggest undermining thing of all this was that like there was two points where it's kind of like, oh, I guess the contest really doesn't matter. Was when like for most of this, Akira is sweeping the contest like their heads like by 16 points or something crazy like that and nobody really says what like the point mark is i thought it was 10 originally but i guess it was just whenever saturn i says yeah we're done <laughs> and <laughs> i thought it was going to be around like 10 but it kept going but the point where yeah. i was kind of like this contest doesn't matter was like when Gorgon is facing off against the White Sword, uh, and the White Sword special powers that he can revive soldiers, and he has a hundred soldiers that he revives every day to fight for him. And Gorgon's fighting the soldiers, and he kills one, and you're like, okay. And then Santa goes, okay, that's one point. And then he kills like two more, and then a couple more, and then like twenty more. And then Santa goes, oh, you got like eighteen points. Good job. I'm like, wait, what? What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, it's 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 kind of like the whose line is it anyway thing where it's uh like we make up the rules and the points don't matter. Like it's I probably I think I flipped that, but it's that sort of thing and that really defeats what could have really been that cool tournament aspect of it. Even if you got through the tournament and ultimately the tournament doesn't matter, which is kind of the exact same plot as Mortal Kombat. Um <laughs> Even if you did that and the tournament was fun during it and you felt like the wins meant something, I think it would have been better. I still think it's an interruption to those other books. But if, you know, like Wolverine gets in a fight and like has a clear victory and there's a cool fight played out through the pages of like the comic, I think that would have been great. They don't do that at all. There's like the fighting is like so minimized within it. It's just... Look, this is a weird thing to say, and I firmly believe that comics are a medium that can really tell any type of story. But these are superhero stories. <laughs> That's what the majority of your audience is looking for here. And if you're going to downplay the fighting in a tournament, you've made a mistake. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, even in the battles they do show, I think they would have been a more, oh, this is a battle of, like wits. Like that's generally what they're going for. I think that would have been cooler if they actually like spend time going like, well, what are the ways around this? How can I win without cheating? What are the, like the loopholes in all of this? And they never really do that. Like there's a dancing contest, there's a runway contest, and those are all like fun ideas there's no swords in them but we saw that play out we saw like how the x-men had to like figure out like well what's the loophole here or something i think that would have made for a more interesting tournament but the reason why i bring up that whole gorgon fight is because uh there's a running theme that saturnize rigging the tournament against the x-men there's a point where he she actually poisons both wolverine and storm so that they nearly lose wolverine actually does lose his fight and she actually uses like a bunch of guards to just fuck up Cat and Britain in, in the middle of one of the other like battles. So there's a running theme. And then I thought it was just strange that she just starts giving a bunch of points to Gorgon. And there's a part of me that just like, oh, they wrote themselves into a corner, didn't they? So they just had to find a way to catch them up. Yeah, and it's funny because, you know, we talked about the different ways that we read it. That You read it really straight through and I was reading it piece by piece. You know, like, you pick that out as, like, specifics. Over time, for me, reading it, it just felt like nothing made any sense. It, like, it felt like there were no rules. None of this had any importance. I wasn't going to get to see any cool fights. Like, it, it was just... And you talked about, like, the different contests. If one book does that and it's, like, this quirky thing, yeah, that's fine. I, the problem is when you have all these... Nothing is, like, just a fight. Like, who cares? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't, you know, I, I've made this argument a bunch of times where, you know, you had a point, and I would say, thankfully, this isn't true anymore. And this is, I would say, largely at Marvel, where Deadpool became, like, this huge character 
arguably the most popular brand they had. And it then felt like for years that they needed five or six books that had that kind of Deadpool comedy in it. And what did it do? It killed all of those titles because no one wants the same thing all the time. And I think the other side of that is, I'll say it again, they're superhero stories. You can't just make it a joke all of the time. It has to be this kind of grand epic thing. And that's certainly where these X books started. And I don't know. I feel like this was like accelerated degeneration in this crossover. <laughs> I don't know if I would go that far, but I definitely see that being an, uh, a problem because it, it's like the two big fights that happened, I guess, is between Wolverine and War. And that's a really short fight. And that's also a fight that literally doesn't matter. Like Wolverine goes into it going like, no matter if I win or lose, like the points don't matter here. Like I, that's literally like the rule of that fight. And there's like a fight between Storm and Death, which is like neither of them really use their powers at that point. Death does in like the very last instance, but like Storm doesn't use her powers in that fight because she was poisoned, which is odd because she spent so much time getting this sword that she had her like become an outlaw in Wakanda to get. And she doesn't even really get to use. And the biggest fight I thought was going to happen was between Apocalypse and Genesis. And that wasn't even really a fight either. None of them really use their abilities or anything. It's just like a sword fight, which is fine. But you have like two of the most powerful mutants in the X-Men universe. Like you would want them to use their powers and they just don't. And even after all of that fighting, like the Helm of Annihilation just goes, nah, doesn't matter. I'm just going to evade anyway. And it's like, well, if this was the ultimate climax of all this, why didn't you like try to see that all the way through? Why didn't you have like both sides trying to scheme this way? Yeah. And you know, you hit the nail on the head there with the climax comic is like, it's a story that has, it has results. It has effects, but any opportunity for a real climax was also kind of diluted. Yeah. I mean, we get the big fight scene between like the armies of annihilation and, you know, all the X-Men and, you know, you have the big splash pages where, Everybody's jumping in. You have all the Captain Britain's core and everything. But I can't help feeling that point. Like, well, I kind of feel like I know the results of this because none of this like felt like it mattered up to now. It's just a strange crossover. Yeah. So I guess we could talk about kind of, we did talk about a little bit of where this might be going. Um, just when we were talking about the specifics of the end of it, you know, we have this reign of X coming and not really sure what that, Entails. I'm hoping it at least gives everyone some issues where they can just get through their own storylines before we do another event. We're also getting X-Men Legends, which is going to be in continuity stories that take place in different time periods. Had you have told me this a year ago, right after House of X Powers of 10, I would have been way more excited because I would have felt like it was going to try to bring everything in line. I have this bad feeling it's not, and it's just going to be sort of an untold tales book. Uh, what do you think on that? I have a feeling that Marvel Legends is kind of going to be, like, they've been releasing them, and they haven't been of that much importance. They've been uh, kind of like Marvel snapshots. But I have a weird feeling that a lot of this Marvel Legends stuff is going to be, like, weird retcons. Yeah, like, I, I'm just, I don't feel like it's going to be what the potential of it is in this era, which is to start going back and, like, tying in things that happened really specifically to Moira McTaggart and all these sort of big bombs that were dropped in House of X Powers of 10. I just feel like it's going to be a, a cash grab because 90s X-Men is like super hot in every other thing they're doing right now. <laughs> I mean, I know uh, we're getting the Children's of the Atom book, which is literally just like these kids they're the next generation, but they dress like the 90s. You love the 90s. Yeah, and I can't help but feel like this is just them like going like, all right, well, Champions did okay. Let's try to do that again. <laughs> I, I have I a just, bit more faith with Children of the Atom, though, but I can see the Champions concern. <laughs> I don't know. It just, it seems like such the wrong move when you have so many characters already in play that you could be using. That book genuinely worries me about where it's going. I don't know if 
X Corporation is even going to happen now. That was announced and then kind of disappeared after the, the shutdown. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to keep reading the books that I was reading. Like, don't get yeah. me wrong. You know, Ten of Swords didn't change my opinion on most of the books. Uh, I'll go back to not reading Excalibur. Um, <laughs> but it, it was a shot at my faith in how well orchestrated this has been you know there have been really great moments i think the giant size x-men specials that hickman was doing have been really cool this was really the first line-wide thing that uh shook my confidence in the direction yeah i can i can understand that i think this really like expanded the world they can play in but it it came at the cost of interrupting a lot of these other books that are in the middle of their storylines like they were able to wrap it up largely but you also felt like you know like in the cable books there could have been more with those robots and stuff like that but there just wasn't and even yeah, Valiant, we, we're really just getting to know this iteration of cable too i i just i think it was just a poor decision to bring all the books in on it hindsight being what it is i think yeah maybe the apocalypse thing happening now is okay i like i said i'd prefer it to have been a longer period of time of kind of implying something was going on and then pulling the trigger but it definitely didn't need to involve everyone in this sort of way if you had done a few issues and then you know gotten to those splash pages where it's like 100 x-men coming through to help out like that would probably be way more effective I can see why they made this like a whole big line thing because I think the importance of this is like that big. It is just like I, I think between COVID and all these other books kind of getting canceled and disappeared and all these other storylines just kind of like going up in smoke. It is odd. I think it does set up other stuff like with Sword. I mean, we might get more stuff with Amenth, which I'm not sure if I'm too excited about. Because I think those demons are kind of boring, uh, honestly. I thought they would do like cool magic, but they don't. We do get Sword. We do get some new writers coming in like in January. But it is... Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's coming. That's, and that's kind of both horrifying and exciting. Uh, not as bad as Future Slate was. Uh, because Future Slate, anything could happen there. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> there should be the uh, like the tagline is future state. Oh, it'll happen. Twenty twenty one is gonna gonna be an interesting year for comics. I think. Yeah, I I think so. I mean, despite all this, I didn't hate it, but I think it was just a lot to digest and get through for not much at the end of the day. Yeah, <laughs> like, twenty-two issues of three issues of material. Like, does anyone really? I know Ivory's character is somebody's favorite character, but like, was anyone really clamoring for the Captain Britain's core? <laughs> well, um, I think that about brings us to the end of X of Swords. A much shorter journey on this podcast than it was for either of us. Yeah, it's just going to be interesting. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this discussion, I, I you guys seem to like. The House of X Powers of 10 one. Uh, maybe you'll be mad at us now because we weren't as uh, over the moon with this. Please do give us those thumbs up, those subscriptions. Uh, click that bell. I don't know. Rate us five stars. There's all sorts of stuff you can do. You can find us on pretty much all social media. Just type in Dissecting Fiction and whatever your preferred social media outlet is. Uh, we're usually there. We don't have a Reddit. Should we make a Reddit? <laughs> we don't need a Reddit. We're good. I like them rumors on Reddit. I learn a lot from Reddit. <laughs> As always, be sure to check out ToyStoreGuide.com. Uh, they got some great independent businesses on there. Uh, if you're in the market for some toys, statues, that type of stuff. Be sure to patronize your local businesses, comic shops, restaurants, barber shops, dry cleaners. There's all sorts of independent businesses in your community. And uh, they all need your help right now. Uh, any final thoughts, Christian? Yeah, uh, here's another Vault book I'm plugging. Read <laughs> I Walk with Monsters. That's a cool book. It's by, about... by the way, they're not paying us, just so you they're know. They're not. I just really like their books. They're really <laughs> weird. Uh, but 
check out I Walk with Monsters. If you like Something is Killing the Children, uh, this has a somewhat similar vibe to that. And uh, it's neat. I mean, there's only one issue out so far, so it could just go downhill really fast. But I recommend the first issue, at least. Actually, as we're recording this, uh, it was just local comic shop day, and uh, Something's Killing the Children got a a cool uh, foil cover, too, so you might want to be on the lookout for that if if you're one of those variant cover folks. Yeah, Uh, I also got the Mighty Morphin slash Power Rangers covers, those foil ones. Oh, boy. We should do one where we fight about that. Have you you've been reading, right? <laughs> I haven't caught. I'm in middle of the Beyond the Grid right now because I've been reading the omnibuses. <laughs> you guys <laughs> that episode. Let us know. Um, I can get up through Shattered Grid, and that's when they lost me. But that that'll be a good discussion. Uh, but I'm Vinny Murphy, and I'm Christian Cutlick, and thanks for listening. Uh-huh.